By the middle of the 7th century BC, northern Mesopotamia had become the heartland of the largest state the world had ever seen. Known today as the Neo-Assyrian Empire, its control stretched throughout Mesopotamia, Syria, the Levant, and even as far north as Anatolia. In the west, its territory ran as far as Egypt, whilst in the east its rule held sway over Susa and parts of the Zagros Mountains. At its peak, it was ruled by a king named Ashurbanipal, who would tout his military prowess and conquests in inscriptions scattered throughout his realm. In the centre of his palace, he built a great library that eventually grew to include some 30,000 clay tablets and that attracted scribes from the four corners of the known world. In modern times, this library is often seen by scholars as Ashurbanipal's crowning achievement, and its remains provide a vivid snapshot into the world that he and his dynasty inhabited. Yet as grand and ancient as Ashurbanipal and his empire might seem to us now, contained amongst the tablets of his library was the story of another king, who had already been famous throughout Mesopotamia for millennia. In the epic that bore his name, he ruled over the great metropolis of Uruk the son of a goddess and a mortal man, possessed of strength and stature beyond all others. His exploits took him the length and breadth of Mesopotamia, and saw him contend with monsters, gods, and his own mortality alike. So great was his quest to thwart death, that it even took him beyond the lands of mortal men, to meet the immortal survivor of a worldwide flood, an event that still echoes in modern religions to this day. Since the very dawn of writing, it provided an ideal of kingship that surpassed all others, and achieved a fame beyond almost any of his successors. Ashurbanipal would prove no exception. By the end of that same century, his dynasty would be extinct, his library buried and forgotten. The great tablets that held this story remained sealed within its ruins for another two millennia, waiting patiently for the day when they would be rediscovered. From that day, the exploits of this legendary king would draw the attention of a worldwide audience, and once again one of the world's oldest known stories would be told. The Epic of Gilgamesh Since its rediscovery at the tail end of the 19th century, the Epic of Gilgamesh has inspired excitement amongst scholars and the general public alike. Originally unearthed amongst the ruins of the library of Ashurbanipal, the discovery of its tablets came amidst a period of newfound interest in both archaeology and early human history. Its deciphering would inspire headlines in newspapers on both sides of the Atlantic, with its publicity being overwhelmingly centred on the flood story contained within one of its tablets. In succeeding decades, knowledge of the epic itself grew amongst the wider public. Soon it became recognised that in the exploits of Gilgamesh lay the blueprints of those of many later mythical figures, including those of Heracles and the heroes of the Homeric poems, the Odyssey and the Iliad. Much like these later heroes, Gilgamesh's restless spirit would take him to what were then the very edges of the known world, to the cedar forest in what is now modern Lebanon and Syria, throughout the land of Babylonia and south to the land of Dilmun in the Persian Gulf. Throughout these travels, he was joined by his faithful companion, Enkidu, who he loved as he would a wife, and whose death at the hands of the eternal gods would drive his own quest to thwart death. Today these central themes of companionship, love, and the human struggle against mortality continue to resonate, and Gilgamesh himself has taken on a life outside of the epic often appearing as a character far removed from his earliest roots. Even then, to many he remains inseparable from the Babylonian epic that bears his name, which this day holds the status of a foundational work in world literature. But what is perhaps less known is that this work is far from Gilgamesh's first appearance in Mesopotamian myth. <laughs> 
In fact, by the time the most famous version of his epic was composed in the late second millennium BC, knowledge of his name and exploits was already more than a thousand years old. Long before Babylon was even a city, there is evidence that Gilgamesh's name was being sung at the courts of the later Sumerian kings, where a rich body of hymns and poems were composed to celebrate his feats and virtues. And before even these works were created, we know that objects were being dedicated in Gilgamesh's honour right back to the precipice of prehistory, and that heroic figures performing deeds resembling his own appear in some of the earliest artwork of the 3rd millennium BC. And it is here, in the hazy world of the earliest kings of Mesopotamia, that some scholars have even argued that a historical figure may have existed, whose life and deeds formed a core ideal of kingship around which the literary epic was crafted. So who was Gilgamesh? How did the epic that bears his name come to be? Was there a historical king of Uruk who bore his name, whose reputation later authors built upon to craft a more familiar epic? And outside of Gilgamesh himself, how did the famous flood myth become part of the epic? In this video, we'll explore these questions by examining more than 2,000 years of history. We'll start by familiarising ourselves with the setting of Gilgamesh's exploits, the Mesopotamian society of the 3rd millennium BC. We'll take a look at what evidence exists for a historical king bearing his name, along with his earliest appearances in the inscriptions of the period. From here, we'll track the development of the epic from its earliest origins among some of the world's first empires, through to the standardised text of the late 2nd millennium BC. Along the way, we'll also examine how Mesopotamia itself changed during the millennia of its existence, and examine what parallels can be drawn between it and the society in which it originated. Finally, we'll examine the origins of an event with which the epic is inexorably tied, the Mesopotamian flood myth, the discovery of which brought the epic to worldwide attention. But before we do any of this, let us begin with the story itself. For those unfamiliar with Gilgamesh and his appearances in Mesopotamian myth, here's a quick summary of the epic for which he is known. In its story, Gilgamesh is the ruler of Uruk, the son of a mortal king named Lugarbanda and of the goddess Ninsun. Possessed of superhuman size and strength, Gilgamesh reigns as a tyrant over the city, exhausting its men and taking its women into his bed. As punishment for abusing his subjects, the gods craft an opponent who is his equal, the wild man Enkidu. After initially residing in the steppe, where he grazes alongside wild animals, Enkidu is discovered by a hunter, then civilised through intercourse with the temple prostitute, Shamhat. After adopting human dress and manners, he travels to Uruk in order to confront Gilgamesh, where the two wrestle in the streets until the very houses of the city shake. Eventually, however, the two cease their battle, and Enkidu instead becomes Gilgamesh's dearest friend, who he loves as he would a wife, and who he frequently refers to as the axe by his side. After this, a restless Gilgamesh then proposes a journey to the Cedar Forest in honour of the sun god Shamash, where he intends to slay its monstrous guardian, Humbaba. With Shamash's help, the two journey to the forest and overcome Humbaba, then construct a raft from the cedar trees to return to Uruk. On arriving back in the city, Gilgamesh then draws the eye of the goddess of love, Ishtar, but rejects her offer of marriage due to her mistreatment of her former suitors. Angered by Gilgamesh's refusal, Ishtar then forces her father Anu to unleash the mighty bull of heaven, which devastates Uruk and its people. Together Gilgamesh and Enkidu overcome this bull, whose horns Gilgamesh dedicates to his father Lugalbanda, whilst Enkidu tears off the bull's right haunch and hurls it in Ishtar's face. As peace seems to have been restored to Uruk, Enkidu has a dream of a gathering of the gods, in which the great gods Anu and Enlil decree that for the crimes of slaying both the bull and Humbaba, Enkidu must die. Struck down by the gods, Enkidu curses the hunter and the prostitute who civilised him from his deathbed, only to be rebuked by Shamash, who reminds him of all the good he has experienced in life because of the two. After Enkidu's death, 
So great is Gilgamesh's grief that he refuses to leave his side for six days and seven nights, only permitting his friend's body to be buried after a maggot drops from its nose. In his mourning for his lost brother, Gilgamesh tears out his hair and clothes himself in the skins of wild animals, then erects a grand statue in tribute to Enkidu. Now fearful of his own death, Gilgamesh sets out to find his ancestor, Utnapishtim, and his wife, who we are told were granted immortality by the gods. Travelling to the twin peaks of Mount Mashu at the ends of the earth, he finds a tunnel that no mortal has entered, guarded by a scorpion man and his wife. Ignoring the man's warnings, he proceeds through the darkness of the tunnel, eventually emerging in a fertile land known as the Garden of the Gods. After killing a group of lions and dressing himself in their skins, he recounts his tale to an alewife, who directs him to Utnapishtim's boatman, Urshabani. After Gilgamesh has first destroyed the enigmatic Stone Ones that allowed Urshabani to travel across the waters of death to Utnapishtim, the boatman instructs Gilgamesh to cut down 120 trees and to fashion them into poles. Crossing the waters, they arrive at a place known as the Mouth of the Rivers, where Utnapishtim and his wife live. After observing Utnapishtim and finding him much the same as himself, Gilgamesh asks him how he came to receive immortality, and Utnapishtim tells him of the great flood sent by the gods to drown mankind. As a survivor of this flood, Utnapishtim was granted immortality by the king of the gods, Enlil, who placed him to live at the mouth of the rivers. Utnapishtim then offers Gilgamesh his own chance at immortality, if only he can stay awake for seven days and nights. Despite his best efforts, Gilgamesh soon falls asleep, waking to discover that seven days have passed, as shown by the bread rations that Utnapishtim's wife has left by his side. Despite Gilgamesh's failure, Utnapishtim gives him another test, sending Gilgamesh in search of a special plant from the ocean floor that will rejuvenate anyone who consumes it. Gilgamesh succeeds in retrieving the plant, only for it to be stolen by a serpent whilst he bathes. Disheartened by his failure, Gilgamesh returns to Uruk, where the main body of the epic ends, with him marvelling to Shibani and the great city wall he has built. Then in a final, somewhat tacked-on tablet, Gilgamesh sends an inexplicably alive Enkidu to retrieve a toy from the Neverworld, only for him to be captured by the dead. With the help of the god Shamash, Gilgamesh then raises Enkidu's shade to the land above, which then informs him of the grim conditions of the underworld and of Gilgamesh's future role as the judge of the dead. So we now have a general idea of the epic's content. But if we are to understand the context of the events that it depicts, along with the timeline of its wider development, we will also need to familiarise ourselves with its setting, the Mesopotamian world of the 3rd millennium BC. For it is in this period that not only is the epic itself set, but that we can also be reasonably sure that any historical Gilgamesh would also have reigned. And in examining this world, we will gain an understanding not only of its society and wider geography, but we will also see the underlying motivations of its characters. Let us begin then. Towards the end of the previous millennium, this region had seen the emergence of the world's first known cities throughout the plains of southern and central Mesopotamia. Of these, by far the largest was the megasite of Uruk, which appears to have exerted a strong cultural influence over the other growing centres of the alluvial plain, along with major economic influence throughout much of the ancient Middle East. As with the other settlements of the region, life in Uruk revolved around the hierarchies of its monumental temple districts, each of which were dedicated to the cult of a major deity. In addition to their role in the religious life of these settlements, these districts appear to have acted as distribution centres for a portion of the city's populace, with their dedicated work being rewarded with fixed amounts of rations. It is also in the context of this system that the world's earliest known written script, Proto-Cuneiform, appears to have emerged. This early writing consisted of a complex system of signs impressed onto clay tablets with a reed stylus that were used at Uruk and other sites throughout the Middle East to administrate their complex temple hierarchies. By far the majority of these tablets were used to record the receipt of goods by the temple, such as grain, dairy products and textiles, along with their distribution to its attendant workforce. 
The remaining tablets consist of a long list of objects, places, and animals, and there is no evidence at this early date for writing being used in anything other than an administrative context. This Uruk influenced trade system continued until around the years 3200 to 3100 BC, when it appears to have faltered. The exact cause of its collapse is still uncertain, although it is possible that it coincided with a change in the local climate that saw much of the Middle East become both drier and colder than in the previous millennium. Whatever its cause, the result was that Mesopotamian influence became restricted to the alluvial plain. In places such as Syria, the Levant and the Iranian plateau, we see the abandonment of proto-cuneiform writing and a resurgence of local pottery styles. Mesopotamia itself entered a period known as the Gemdet Nasser, characterised by a change from the manufacture of more plain styles of pottery to that of painted pottery with a distinctive purple colouring. Other than this pottery, however, the Gemdet Nasser appears to have gladly continued the practices of the preceding Uruk period. Proto-Cuneiform writing also continued to be developed throughout this time, and we know from lists of city names dating to this period that the individual settlements of the Mesopotamian plain were already engaged in complex political and economic relationships with one another. A common religious system may also have been in place throughout the region, with its focus being the city of Uruk. This is demonstrated by tablets and clay ceilings that have been interpreted as offerings presented from other settlements to its goddess Inanna also known under her later name of Ishtar. Compared to the Uruk period before it, the Gemdet Nasser appears to have been short-lived, to the point where there is still some debate as to whether it should be considered a separate archaeological period at all. By comparison, its successor, the early dynastic period, would last for much of the 3rd millennium BC, and saw the rise of one of the world's most iconic early civilizations, the Sumerians. Throughout the early part of this period, we begin to see increasing growth of individual settlements into major urban centres throughout both southern and central Mesopotamia. Whilst Uruk remained a key player in the politics of the region, it now had to compete with other prominent city-states, such as Ur, Lagash, Uma, and Kish, each of which controlled varying degrees of territory. Generally speaking, the influence of each of these cities was limited to its surrounding agricultural land, which would have stretched in a narrow band along either the river Euphrates or the Tigris for an average of 10 to 15 kilometres in either direction. Between them lay a patchwork mosaic of alluvial deserts, resource-rich swamps and marshland, and patches of less inhabited steppe that were often used for seasonal grazing. Each city also seems to have become recognised as the dwelling place of a number of gods and goddesses that were joined into a more unified pantheon, and at an unclear point the centre of Mesopotamian religion transferred from the cult of Inanna at Uruk to the cult of Enlil at Nippur. Inside the cities themselves, the temple authorities that dominated political and economic life throughout the Uruk period also remained though increasingly their power was counterbalanced by a new group of figures under the titles of En, Ensi, and Lugal. Commonly referred to as kings by modern archaeologists, how exactly these figures emerged is still a source of contention, but it seems that from an early date, these figures combined military power with important political and religious roles within the city. Alongside the emergence of these figures, this period is also characterised by increased military activity between these states as shown by the appearance of widespread city fortifications throughout the first half of the early dynastic period. Alongside these changes, many of the basic blueprints of Mesopotamian society established in the preceding Uruk period continued to be refined upon throughout the 3rd millennium BC. Agriculture continued to depend on the careful management of water supplied by the Euphrates and the Tigris, and crop irrigation seems to have become ever more important as the climate in the region slowly dried out. Administration and trade was still performed using cylinder seals, small round objects carved with inlaid scenes that could be impressed onto wet clay as an identifier. Later these objects would also take on an important role in the correspondence between different city-states and rulers, whose relationships grew more complex and formalised. Cuneiform writing also evolved to take on similar roles, 
slowly losing many of its pictographic qualities in favour of both syllabic and phonetic elements, along with a more developed system of grammar. The result is that unlike the earlier proto-cuneiform tablets, to which we are largely unable to assign a language, this later script is clearly recognisable as Sumerian, a language spoken by people of southern Mesopotamia during this period. And from around the middle of the early dynastic period, we also see the increasing use of royal inscriptions throughout the region, the names of kings being inscribed on objects such as stone vessels, stele, and votive offerings. So now that we have some understanding of the society in which the epic is set, let us ask our first question. Is there any evidence for a historical monarch that dates from this period behind the later literary figure of Gilgamesh? Understandably, this question draws a mixed response from archaeologists and scholars of the period. To paraphrase Professor Piotr Mikhailowski, for some the search for a historical Gilgamesh is a serious enterprise, whilst for others it is equivalent to the quest to discover the real King Arthur, the Paladin Roland, or the abominable snowman. A few scholars, such as Max Malawan, Barry Powell and Stephanie Daly have been willing to entertain the idea that a monarch carrying this name could have reigned at Uruk somewhere between 2800 and 2600 BC, with these arguments being based on later literary accounts and a small number of contemporary inscriptions. On the whole, however, most archaeologists agree that there is no way to prove the existence of such a king using the evidence that we have at our disposal, and that as such he is best treated as a purely mythical figure. And looking at the excavations that have been carried out at Uruk, it is easy to see why many have drawn that conclusion. In the collection of stories in which he features, Gilgamesh is intimately associated with the central ritual districts of Uruk, the Eana and the Kulab, both of which have been extensively excavated. If such a figure did exist, then it is in these districts that we may expect to find some evidence for his existence, especially as a possible dating to around the 27th century BC roughly overlaps with the appearance of the earliest known royal inscriptions in southern Mesopotamia. Unfortunately for us, however, no evidence of any writing or inscriptions have been found at the city dating from this period. Indeed, there is also little evidence for monumental building at the centre of Uruk during this time. The one exception to this can be found in the Eana district, where the 3rd millennium BC is marked by the development of a number of enigmatic structures that culminated in its final centuries in a large ziggurat dedicated to the goddess Inanna. Outside of these structures, two possible explanations have been proposed for the lack of evidence for monumental building here in the early dynastic period. The first is that extensive parts of the complex may well have been destroyed or damaged by a later invasion that we know took place somewhere between the 24th and the 23rd century BC. The second and better attested theory is that many older structures in this era could have been destroyed during its remodeling by a later king named Ur Namu, whose name can be found inscribed on the ziggurat's bricks. Either way, what is clear is that there is no evidence of Gilgamesh to be found in the central districts of Uruk itself. But there is another monumental feature at Uruk that is famously associated with Gilgamesh, and whose first construction would be credited to him in the earliest literary texts in which he features, the Great Wall of Uruk. Constructed in a period when Uruk was nearing its peak size, this vast fortification stretches for over 9 kilometres, and encircles an area of over 500 hectares. Built from fired mud bricks, the wall itself averages 9 metres thick in most areas, and its surrounding complex measures some 40 metres in width. Embedded inside it are a vast system of buttresses, towers and entranceways, along with inlets and outlets for the city's canals. This wall is certainly impressive, and its construction does correlate with a period when the city was known to be both large and powerful. But unfortunately, only limited excavations of its sections have been carried out, and what work has been done has found no evidence at all to connect its construction to Gilgamesh. Whilst later kings are known to have placed votive objects inscribed with their names within the foundations of their major building projects, no such objects have been found beneath the excavated parts of Uruk's wall, leaving us unable to connect its construction to any historical figure. The exact dating of the wall is also uncertain, though most archaeologists place its construction at the beginning of the early dynastic period. 
which may well be too early for most estimates of historical Gilgamesh's reign. So if there was a historical Gilgamesh, there is no evidence of him to be found at his namesake city, nor at any other centre throughout Mesopotamia during the first half of the early dynastic period. Instead, if we wish to find his earliest attestations, we have to skip forward by a couple of centuries. It is here, as we enter the later part of the early dynastic period, that Gilgamesh's name is first found under its Sumerian spelling of Bilgamesh, nearly a half a millennium before his first known literary appearance. Here he appears not as a king, but as part of a list of gods unearthed at the site of Shuropa that dates from roughly the 26th to the 25th century BC. Whilst he receives no special treatment on this list, his placing already seems to show an association with Uruk, as the entry above his reads Silla du Kulab, or Road Facing Kulab, referring to one of the city's central districts. Beyond this gods list, we also find more information regarding Gilgamesh appearing in a small number of inscriptions dedicated to him that date from around the 24th century BC. One such inscription is preserved on a ceremonial stone macehead of unknown providence that were frequently made as votive offerings to a particular god or goddess. To quote its text, To Bilgamesh, the king of men, earning Garima, the son of the shepherd Luga Kagani, has dedicated this artfully made mace. It is of alabaster. To him, the strong one, the son of the goddess Ninsuman, for his own life and for the lives of his wife and their children. From this inscription, we can conclude a few details to complement the limited information given in the gods list. For a start, whilst we know that Gilgamesh was clearly regarded as a god during this period, and even the recipient of votive offerings, we also see him named here as a king of men, an inclusion that may reflect his dual nature and his later literary appearances. Secondly, we see the first mention of his divine parentage, specifically that he is the son of the goddess Ninsumun, later known under her familiar name of Ninsun. Finally, from his earliest attestations, we see that Gilgamesh is already being associated with idealized epithets of Mesopotamian kingship, with his title of the Strong One being frequently adopted by kings in the late 3rd millennium BC. These two texts raise an interesting possibility. As Gilgamesh's earliest attestations in this period are as a god rather than a king, are we to assume that he began his existence as a deity, only later being given a historical background as a king of Uruk? This is certainly a possibility, but we should also note that the Macehead inscription does directly refer to him as a king of men. An additional factor that we can conclude from these early inscriptions is that whilst some of Gilgamesh's later attributes are already present, there is little evidence of him being associated with many of the deeds we will see in the later epic. This is also reflected in the small group of literary texts that have come down to us from the early dynastic period. These texts are largely limited to those that have been excavated from the city of Abu Salabik in central Mesopotamia, along with those found at both Mari and Ebla in modern Syria. The archaic and often fragmentary nature of these texts makes them difficult to comprehend, and understanding is often reliant on the existence of a later copy of the same text in a more readable script. Examples of this include a wisdom text known as the Instructions of Shuropak, later versions of which are addressed from the city's eponymous king to his son, Ziosudra, along with a number of hymns and other mythological texts. By far the most significant of these texts for our purposes, however, is a fragment of a mythological tale of the lovemaking between the mortal hero Lugalbanda and the goddess Ninsun, which some scholars have attempted to relate to the birth of Gilgamesh. However, according to a Syriologist, Andrew R. George, at no point does this name appear in the tale, and indeed the state of the fragment is such that even the idea of it referring to a birth remains unproven. As we will soon see, there are also good reasons to doubt that Bugarbanda was considered Gilgamesh's father at this early date. In addition to this text, two others from Abu Salabik have also been claimed to mention Gilgamesh himself, although the validity of these claims remains controversial. Moving beyond what written evidence we have available, it is also often noted that figures resembling both Gilgamesh and his companion Enkidu frequently appear in Mesopotamian artwork dating to the early dynastic period. Indeed, we frequently see heroic figures portrayed on cylinder seals and carvings from this period, often being depicted in forms of heroic nudity and wrestling with animals such as lions 
and bulls. This latter motif, known as the Master of Animals, is a common one throughout the region, and is known to date back to at least the 7th millennium BC. It is certainly possible that these figures represent events from the later epic, particularly Gilgamesh's contention with either the Bull of Heaven or his later encounter with a group of lions whose skin he clothes himself in during his search for immortality. Unfortunately for us, however, we have no examples of direct inscriptions naming either Gilgamesh or Enkidu alongside these works, and it is entirely possible that they depict other heroic figures from the period, or that they simply represent more generic heroic archetypes. So from what we've covered here, we can conclude that to the people of early dynastic Mesopotamia, Gilgamesh was known as a god worthy of dedications, as a king of men, and that his name was associated with at least one of the epithets given to later rulers. But outside of this, we have no clear evidence that he was ever a historical king of Uruk, or that he was a fixture in the literature of this time. At this point, we could easily abandon our search for a historical Gilgamesh, and assign him purely to the realm of mythology. However, in doing so, we would be ignoring a small amount of indirect evidence that a number of scholars have pointed to as at least leaving his existence an open question. And to observe this evidence, we must leave the world of early dynastic Sumer behind and examine social and political developments within central and southern Mesopotamia right at the end of the 3rd millennium BC. Unlike the largely fragmented city-states that had characterised the region for much of the previous millennium, the centuries ahead would see periodic unifications of the region under a single ruler. Prior to the rise of its first lasting empire, there had been a number of erstwhile conquerors of Mesopotamia, but none of them appears to have succeeded in subduing lands far beyond the south, or in passing their conquests on to a successor. It would take until the 24th century BC before a king would establish a lasting empire encompassing most of Mesopotamia. And when it happened, its founder would not be a Sumerian, but an Akkadian. The Akkadians were a group of peoples from central Mesopotamia, a region that itself came to be referred to as Akkad. Unlike their Sumerian neighbours, they spoke a Semitic language known as Akkadian but otherwise they shared many cultural similarities and worshipped a similar pantheon of gods under differing names. As with the Sumerians, their exact origin point is uncertain, but we do know that they were present in the region from at least the beginning of the 3rd millennium BC, as shown by the appearance of Akkadian names in the earliest cuneiform texts. And in the 24th century BC, it was a man from this region who would build what has been described as the world's first empire. Known as Sargon, later literary descriptions would cast him as a cupbearer, the king of Kish, or even a simple labourer in the palace gardens. At an unknown point, he appears to have risen to power in central Mesopotamia, after which he invaded the south and subdued the Sumerian city-states. In doing so, he deposed another aspiring conqueror, a king by the name of Lugal Zagezi, who had recently subdued much of Sumer and led him in a neck stock to the temple at Nippur. With the two regions now under his control, he established his capital at the city of Akkad, also known as Agade, which he either founded or greatly expanded. Finally, he succeeded in doing something that no previous ruler had done, and passed on this empire intact to his successors. This Akkadian empire would persist for nearly two centuries, reaching its peak in the 23rd century BC under Sargon's grandson, Naram-Sin. If we are to believe inscriptions from his long reign, then Naram-Sin succeeded in expanding the empire to the state of Elam and the peoples of the Zagros Mountains to the east, and as far west as the states of the eastern Mediterranean. Exactly how much of this westward conquest was rooted in propaganda is uncertain. For all we know, it may simply have been a successful raiding party to the region. Either way, this success led Naram-Sin to take on unprecedented titles including King of the Four Quarters and King of the Universe. Eventually, he was no longer content to simply rule as a mortal, and in a famous victory stele dating from his reign, he is depicted standing above his men as a giant, crowned with the horned helmet of a god. Naram-Sin's reign would bring the Akkadian Empire to its greatest extent, 
but it also proved to be its high watermark. Exactly how intact the empire was towards the end of his reign is uncertain, but after his death it quickly collapsed, with possible causes being the combined stress of a major drought known as the 4.2 kill year event and a series of invasions of a group of peoples from the Zagros Mountains to the east. What follows was an archaeologically obscure period that lasted for most of the 22nd century BC, during which these invaders, known as the Gutians, appear to have exercised a loose hegemony over the other cities of the alluvial plain. And then at the end of this period, we are told from inscriptional evidence that the invaders were ejected from Sumer by a confederation of cities led by Utuhengal, the king of Uruk. Utuhengal would not survive his victory for long, however, and in the ensuing power vacuum it would be his relative ur Namu, the governor of Ur, who would succeed in establishing the second major unified state of Mesopotamia. Known as the Third Dynasty of Ur, or the Neo-Sumerian Empire, this state would resurrect the status of Uruk as a major centre for the worship of the goddess Inanna, and embark on an ambitious ziggurat building program throughout southern Mesopotamia. Initially restricted to the regions of Sumer and Akkad, this empire would expand eastwards, beginning with the reign of Ernamo's successor, Shulgi, coming to dominate the neighbouring region of Elam in what is now southwestern Iran. Whilst the resulting state was less far-reaching than the Akkadian Empire, it appears to have been more internally centralised, consisting of a carefully administered core in Mesopotamia, which maintained a system of diplomatic contacts with the periphery beyond. Shulgi and his successors would go on to adopt the divine kingship of Naram-Sin, with Shulgi himself demonstrating a special reverence for Gilgamesh, who he frequently named in his hymns. Finally, the royal court of Ur also appears to have established a uniform writing system within its borders, establishing and sponsoring new scribal schools in the process. It is in these scribal schools that we see a new period of creativity in Sumerian literature, along with the appearance of the first documents to shed light on what the peoples of southern Mesopotamia considered their history. And it is also through the lens of these documents that we see what some have argued is evidence for Gilgamesh's existence. By far the most famous of these documents is known to us as the Sumerian King List, a collection of manuscripts outlining the supposed history of the kings of Sumer, the earliest version of which dates back to the ur free period. Later versions of this document detail the descent of the divine kingship of Sumer from the heavens, through an unbroken line of rulers, first to the city of Eridu in the south, then to the city of Kish after a great flood had swept across the land. After 23 kings had reigned in Kish, the city was defeated by Uruk and the kingship taken to the Yana district. In this list, Gilgamesh is presented as a member of the first dynasty of Uruk, with his name being followed by the epithet, Lord of the Kulab. Interestingly, his father is listed here not as Lugalbanda, but instead as a phantom or a demon, and his immediate predecessor is given as the god of shepherds and fertility, the Muzid. For some time after its discovery, many scholars considered this list to have a degree of usefulness as a source of information on Mesopotamian history, at least in the abstract. Over time, however, a greater awareness of its flaws has developed, and it is clear that the King's List existed less as an accurate chronicle of Mesopotamian rulers, and more as a form of propaganda designed to legitimise the rule of later dynasties. For a start, it presents Sumer as having been ruled over by an unbroken line of kings with only one city possessing the kingship at a time. Many of its earlier rulers are also assigned reigns of an extraordinary length. Gilgamesh himself is credited a reign of some 126 years, and this length is dwarfed by that of the pre-flood rulers, one of whom is assigned a rule of some 36,000 years. Excavations at centres throughout southern Mesopotamia have also found ample evidence of kings who exerted a wide degree of power throughout the region yet whose names are not included on the list. Finally, this document also seems to have been periodically revised to take into account disputes between competing city-states and dynasties. For example, in its earliest versions, the first dynasty to receive the kingship is that of the city of Kish, and a smaller number of dynasties are listed between it and Akkad. In later copies, however, Kish has been demoted to the second dynasty on the list, with the kingship originally dwelling at the site of Eridu, for which there is no evidence of a dynasty possessing hegemony over the other cities of the region. <laughs>
Despite all these caveats, there are two early rulers on this list, for whom some limited inscriptional evidence has been found, both of whom are named in later literary texts as contemporaries of Gilgamesh. They consist of the final two rulers of the first dynasty of Kish, and appear to date from a period when the city was indeed large and prosperous. The first is a king by the name of Mibaragisi, later known as En Mibaragisi, for whom a small number of inscriptions have been found. In one such inscription, found on a fragment of an alabaster vessel of uncertain providence, Mibaragisi is named as the King of Kish, making him the earliest known Mesopotamian king whose name is verified by contemporary evidence. Based on the archaic rendering of the symbol for Kish, this inscription is thought to date from the first half of the early dynastic period, and matches well with a hypothetical date for an historical Gilgamesh. The second ruler on the king list associated with Gilgamesh in later literary accounts is the figure of Akka, or Aga, son of Enmibaragisi, and the final ruler of the first dynasty of Kish. Unlike Enmibaragisi, we have no contemporary inscription naming Akka as a king of Kish. Instead, a figure who may be Akka is attested to on a single stone stele that likely originated from the city of Uma in southern Mesopotamia. This stele, known as the Stele of Ushumgal, also dates from the first part of the early dynastic period, and is thought to relate to a land transaction between the priest Ushumgal and an unknown woman who is possibly his daughter. Most interestingly for our purpose, this stele also features a carving of a man, next to which is the following inscription. Akka of the Great Assembly Whether or not this figure is the Akka of the King's List and later literary texts is uncertain. If so, then it would indicate that Kish's hegemony during the first part of the early dynastic period ran at least as far south as Uma, which is certainly a possibility. Indeed, we do have an inscribed gem of unknown provenance that directly names Aga as a king of Uma, although whether or not he was a king of Kish remains uncertain. We also know from the inscriptions that a historical king who claimed to rule Kish, known as Meselim, held a degree of power in neighbouring Lagash, and according to later traditions, he may well have mediated a land dispute between it and Uma. It has also been argued by Dr. Gebhard Selfs that the personal name Akka was fairly rare in the early dynastic period, which may lessen the chance of it being a coincidence. In our final piece of indirect evidence, Gilgamesh is also named alongside a list of later kings, likely dating from just after the end of the Ur Free dynasty. Known as the Tumal inscription, this text outlines a series of rulers who are credited with the building and rebuilding of various temples at the holy city of Nippur. In this list, Gilgamesh is credited with building the Dunonmon Bura, a shrine that is known there from archaeological evidence, though these excavations found no sign of any associations with this figure. What is perhaps as significant, however, is that in addition to the historical personage of Enmibaragisi and the possibly historical Akka, Gilgamesh is mentioned alongside at least two other known kings of the southern city of Ur, Misanipada, and his son, Meskiagnuna. In addition to appearing on the Sumerian king list, Misanipada is also known as a king from objects bearing his inscriptions at what may be his tomb at the royal cemetery of Ur, along with an inscribed bead found at the city of Mari, far to the northwest. Whilst less well attested than his father, Meskiagnuna is known from a small number of bow inscriptions made in his honour by his wife, in which he is named as the Lugal, or King of Ur. However, it should also be noted that nowhere in this inscription are either of these kings named as contemporaries of Gilgamesh, merely that they also dedicated various temple structures in Nippur. So what can we conclude from these various inscriptions? Well, it seems likely that some of the figures later associated with Gilgamesh were historical kings, though how much their actual deeds and lives resemble those of the later literary tales is impossible to say. As such, some scholars have argued that their existence at least opens the possibility of Gilgamesh himself being a historical figure. Despite this, we still have no definitive evidence of the existence of Gilgamesh himself, and in the absence of such evidence, we must consign him for now to the world of myth. But as we end the hunt for a historical Gilgamesh, we now begin to see the literary figure emerge in earnest. For it is during the period of the ur dynasty that we see the first appearance of the exploits of Gilgamesh as a figure of myth. 
along with the character that he is most commonly associated with, Enkidu. The Neo-Sumerian Gilgamesh corpus exists in a largely fragmentary fashion today. It consists of five poems written in Sumerian, one of which has been found in two separate versions, along with a small number of dedicatory hymns. Whilst we can be reasonably confident from their language that they originated in the ur free period, only one has been found in fragmentary form dating from this time, and most of these texts exist only in copies written by scribes a few centuries later. Even in these later forms, two of the texts remain only partially complete. What we have, however, is enough to recognise episodes of the later Babylonian epic. In the tale of Gilgamesh and Huawa, we see a story highly resembling that of the Cedar Forest incident, though with both a different inciting reason and location. In this story, the eponymous king proposes an expedition to the Cedar Forests of the Zagros Mountains, in order to achieve lasting fame for himself after his death. After amassing a company of young men to aid them, Gilgamesh and Enkidu cross sevenfold mountain ranges before finally finding a tree that matches their requirements. After cutting the tree into logs, they anger the forest protector, a monstrous figure known as Huwawa, who knocks both Gilgamesh and Enkidu unconscious with one of his auras. Eventually Enkidu awakens and manages to rouse Gilgamesh, who swears revenge on his assailant. Together the two trick Huwawa into forming a marriage alliance with two of Gilgamesh's sisters and in the process of exchanging marital gifts, they rob him of his auras, now conceptualised as great cedar trees. After the Guardian has been rendered helpless, Gilgamesh considers letting him live, but Enkidu cuts his throat after warning the two would never see home again if he was allowed to live. With this done, Gilgamesh and his men cut his auras into logs and return home. There they offer Huawa's head to the great god Enlil, who angrily berates them for their actions, before distributing his auras throughout the land. In the second Gilgamesh tale, we similarly see a precursor to one of Gilgamesh's other famed adventures, his contention with the Bull of Heaven. In this story, Gilgamesh is instructed by his mother, Ninsun, to carry out his duties and sit in judgement, only for him to be detained by the goddess of love, Inanna. Here she proposes that Gilgamesh become lord to her lady, but he rejects her, in some versions due to his mother forbidding the union. After a missing section of text, Inanna is found weeping by her father, the sky god Anu, who she asks to give her the celestial bull of heaven with which to kill Gilgamesh. Anu refuses, as the bull of heaven would find no food on earth, only for Inanna to emit an infernal scream that forces her father to give in. She then leads the bull down to Uruk, where it destroys the date palms and consumes the river. Gilgamesh is informed of the creature's arrival by his minstrel, and after quenching his thirst with ale, he vows to dismember the bull. Together he and Enkidu dispatch the bull by finding its weak point, after which Enkidu hurls its haunch at Inanna. Finally Gilgamesh fulfills his promise and distributes the bull's meat amongst the poor, though he dedicates the horns to Inanna. In both of these poems, we see clear parallels to later episodes of the epic, though in each case these accounts are similar only in their outlines. In addition to this, elements of these stories are also thought by some scholars to give insight into Mesopotamian society of the time. For example, Gilgamesh's expedition to the Cedar Forest is seen by Uruk scholars Margaret Van Es and Reindeer Neef as reflecting the actual needs of monumental building projects conducted by Mesopotamian kings during this period, as the palm, poplar and tamarisk wood of the alluvial plain is either too soft or grows too short to be of much use in monumental construction. By comparison, cedar wood is an ideal building material that would indeed have been found in the Zagros Mountains to the east, and we know that Mesopotamian kings from this period would go to great lengths to secure this precious material. In the later epic, this event would also be relocated westwards to what is now modern Lebanon, a change that coincides with the increasing importance of western states during the second millennium BC. Similarly, Gilgamesh's refusal of marriage to the goddess Inanna is also thought to parallel literary descriptions of the sacred marriage ceremony between Mesopotamian kings and the city's goddess, 
though whether these ceremonies actually occurred or not is a topic of some debate. When we move beyond these two works, however, what is perhaps surprising is that the remaining Sumerian poems contain no clear parallels at all to the later epic, and indeed one of them contains no mythical or supernatural elements at all. Where they do appear to have played an important role, however, is in informing the later themes of the Babylonian epic, particularly that of human mortality and Gilgamesh's struggle to escape death. In the first of these tales, known as Gilgamesh and the Neverworld, we see Gilgamesh's increasing association with the Mesopotamian afterlife. After a prologue describing how the gods divided the universe between them, a great storm blows down a willow tree on the banks of the Euphrates. Soon after, the goddess Inanna happens across the tree, which she takes back to Uruk and plants at the Iana district. To her dismay, this tree then becomes infested by evil creatures, and after failing to gain the help of the sun god, Utu, Inanna turns to Gilgamesh for help. Taking up his weapons, Gilgamesh rids the tree of its inhabitants, then carves it into wood for Inanna's furniture. From what remains, he carves two toys, most likely a boar and a mallet, and the next day he plays with these, wearing out his subjects in the process. The day after, as Gilgamesh is about to resume his play, the women of the city complain, and somehow the toys fall into the Neverworld. Gilgamesh then dispatches his servant Enkidu to retrieve them, only for him to be taken captive after he fails to show the shades of the dead the proper respect. Horrified at what has happened, Gilgamesh petitions the gods for help. In the end, only Enki, the Sumerian god of water and mischief, will listen, and with the help of Utu, they raise Enkidu from the Neverworld as a shade. In a lengthy series of questions, Gilgamesh asks Enkidu of the condition of the dead, and learns how the first they suffer can be relieved by offerings of fresh water by their descendants. This examination of death and the afterlife continues in the second of these tales, known as the Death of Gilgamesh. As the poem begins, we learn that Gilgamesh has been seized by Namtar, the emissary of death, and now lies dying. In his guise as the Lord of Creation, the god Enki shows Gilgamesh a vision of the gods judging his exploits in the Cedar Forest and the previously unmentioned journey to the end of the world. Here we are told he learned wisdom from a man named Zisudra, the only survivor of an event known as the Deluge, an exploit for which the gods granted him immortality. Gilgamesh is then told that immortality has not been decreed for him, but after his descent to the underworld he will be given a special place as the judge of the dead. As consolation for this fate, he is told he will be reunited there with Enkidu and his family, and that he will be revered as a deity. After awaking from this dream, Gilgamesh appears to seek counsel, and after a gap in the text, he is advised that he should not be sad at his fate. The poem then concludes with the people of Uruk building Gilgamesh's tomb at Enki's instruction. After diverting the river Euphrates, they build a stone tomb on the dry riverbed, into which Gilgamesh, his wives and his retinue are sealed. The river is then returned to its normal course in order to conceal the tomb, and the people of Uruk mourn their king. According to Andrew R. George, the poem then concludes either by praising Gilgamesh as the greatest of kings, or by explaining that the dead survive in the memories of the living. Between these four poems, we can see many of the themes that would appear in the more developed epic of the second millennium BC. In both Gilgamesh and Huawa, and Gilgamesh and the Neverworld, we see the king's fear of death, and of the great deeds that he undertakes in order to grant his name lasting fame. In the confrontations between Gilgamesh and Huawa, and later the Ball of Heaven, we see the first signs of his great physical prowess, whilst in Gilgamesh and the Neverworld we see early signs of his tyranny over the people of Uruk. In the death of Gilgamesh we also see his first association with the immortal survivor of the Flood, a significant step for the development of the later epic. In Gilgamesh and the Neverworld we also have an important source for the Mesopotamian concept of the Underworld. Here they believe the dead carried out a shadowy existence, where they either roamed naked or clothed in birds' feathers, with only dust to sate their thirst. With the exception of figures such as Gilgamesh, who received an exalted position near enough to actual life, the only respite from this existence was thought to be through the offerings of libations given to the dead 
by the living. It is for this reason that people in Mesopotamia considered having many descendants to be of the utmost importance, as those who died without descendants were consigned to the worst form of existence imaginable. Finally, the descriptions of Gilgamesh being buried alongside his royal entourage and harem has drawn comparisons to what may have been actual burial practices from the time. The most famous example of this has been found at what has been dubbed the Royal Cemetery of Ur, where a mass grave known as the Great Death Pit was unearthed in the 1920s by a team led by British archaeologist Leonard Woolley. Inside this pit, the remains of up to 74 men and women were found, who appeared to have been musicians, attendants and bodyguards of the tomb's occupant. Each of these people was killed by being struck over the head with an axe, after which their bodies were embalmed, dressed and laid out neatly as if in life. It is uncertain how willing any of these deaths were, or if the burial was truly royal in nature, but its existence indicates that mass internments of otherwise healthy followers alongside significant figures were not unknown in ancient Mesopotamian society. We come now to the final Sumerian Gilgamesh poem. Here we find a story that seems to have no connection at all to the later epic, and it is completely devoid of mythical or supernatural elements. Known as Gilgamesh and Akka, it concerns the contention between the cities of Kish and Uruk for the hegemony of Sumer. In this story, the king of Kish, Akka, sends emissaries to Uruk demanding its submission. In response, Gilgamesh seeks the counsel of the city's elders, who caution him to submit rather than going to war. Ignoring their advice, Gilgamesh instead secures agreement from the young men of the city, who laud his prowess and predict his victory. Soon after this, Akka arrives and lays siege to Uruk. Gilgamesh asks for a volunteer to challenge Akka to single combat, and his guard Burhirtura volunteers. On leaving the city, however, Burhirtura is immediately captured, beaten, and then brought before Akka. The steward of Uruk then appears on its walls, and Akka asks the hapless guard if this is Gilgamesh. Behertura answers that it is not, and if it were, Akka would soon be vanquished, a reply that earns him yet another beating. Gilgamesh then appears on the wall, and when Akka asks Behertura the same question, he answers in the affirmative. Akka is then swiftly captured by Gilgamesh, who repays an old debt to him by freeing him and allowing him to return to Kish. Whilst the events of the envoys of Akka are all but disconnected from the later epic, it does give us some sense of how the Sumerians viewed the idea of kingship, and like the contemporary king list, it provides us with some information on how these people saw their own history. A number of scholars have also hypothesized that elements of this story reflect some aspects of Sumerian society that go undocumented elsewhere. For example, Gilgamesh's consultation with both the elders and the young men of the city has been taken as evidence of an early form of democracy, where the head of a Sumerian city-state would consult with distinguished men of the city prior to making major decisions. Similarly, the appointment of a champion to fight Akka on Gilgamesh's behalf points to the idea that early warfare in southern Mesopotamia may have often had a more ceremonial element than the fully pitched battles that we often envision. These hypotheses are certainly interesting, though for the moment they remain just that. Another interesting aspect of these Sumerian poems is the elements that they lack compared to the later epic. Perhaps the most striking of these is that whilst they mark the first clear appearance of Enkidu, his role is clearly less developed. Not only does he lack his later wild man attributes, but in the text he is usually described as a servant to Gilgamesh, rather than an equal partner. In the past, scholars such as Geoffrey Tige have used this difference in status to argue that the friendship between the two is an invention entirely of later authors, whilst Andrew R. George has argued that some elements of the deeper friendship can be seen in Gilgamesh's emotional reaction to Enkidu's death in Gilgamesh and the Neverworld. The differences in Enkidu's presentation have also led some past scholars to hypothesize that Enkidu was himself the subject of a separate body of literature that was later integrated into the Gilgamesh epic. However, no evidence whatsoever has been found to support this idea and it is now known that there are other potential sources of Enkidu's wild attributes. So how did these poems come to be written? 
Up until now, the only evidence we have of Gilgamesh are a few scattered inscriptions and some possible depictions in artwork that date to the early dynastic period. One argument is that these stories may have previously existed within wider Mesopotamian society as oral traditions. Indeed, there is some evidence that these works were recited aloud during the ur free period, as shown by the inclusion of hymnic elements in the introduction of the poem Gilgamesh and the Bull of Heaven. If this is true, then these poems may well have been read as a form of courtly entertainment for the ur free kings, much as Gilgamesh is entertained by his court musician, Lugal Gabagal. However, if these tales were originally oral compositions, there is little evidence of this to be found within the texts themselves, which lack many of the features associated with oral storytelling. Another argument against this possibility is that as we have previously covered, we do have some early examples of Mesopotamian literature dating back to the early dynastic period, and amongst those there is no undisputed evidence of tales related to Gilgamesh. We also have no evidence for Gilgamesh in literature dating from the immediately preceding periods, though the picture here is complicated by the fact that the Akkadian capital is still yet to be located, and that the Gutian period is poorly attested archaeologically. On the whole, however, it seems more likely that these works were original compositions created by scribes at the academies of the ur free kings to flesh out previous traditions and deeds that had been associated with Gilgamesh in prior centuries. Indeed, we know from the hymns of the time that the second ur free ruler, Shulgi, held Gilgamesh in a particularly high regard, and it would not be surprising if the poems were composed at his instruction to honour a ruler with whom he felt a special kinship. So strong was this feeling, in fact, that Shulgi would even declare Gilgamesh his adoptive brother, as shown in the sections of a surviving hymn. Quote, Shulgi, the righteous shepherd of Samir praises his brother and friend, the Lord Gilgamesh, in his might, addresses him in his heroism. Mighty one in battle, a devastating flood who smites the enemy in the heat of the combat. A catapult of the holy wall, skilled in hurling the sling stone. Against the house of Kish you brought forth your weapons. Its seven heroes you captured dead. The king of Kish, Emma Baragizi, you trampled on his head, as if he were a snake. You brought over the kingship from Kish to Uruk. Another thread that scholar Geoffrey Tige has noted is the resemblance between many of the physical feats attributed to Shulgi in his hymns, such as his skill at wrestling and athletics, and those of Gilgamesh in the later epic. Alternatively, these kingly attributes may reflect those attributed to the Akkadian kings, particularly the godlike stature claimed by Naram Sin. Ultimately, though, we have no way of knowing if either of these figures influenced Gilgamesh's depictions, and it is just as likely that his athletic prowess is influenced by common attributes claimed by Mesopotamian kings throughout history. So to conclude our discussions of the Sumerian Gilgamesh poems, let us quickly discuss another question that divided scholars after their initial discovery, whether they belong to a unified Sumerian epic. It was initially taken for granted that these works were indeed part of a larger narrative, and it was not until the work of Samuel Kramer in the 1940s that the idea was disputed. Over time, however, scholars have concluded that there is no evidence at all that these tales were considered part of a unified epic. Not only is there no evidence of these poems being grouped together during ancient times, but as we have explored earlier, these poems lack many of the central plot points or fully developed themes of the later epic. There is also no clear evidence of textual passages linking the individual poems together. The one small piece of evidence to the contrary is the existence of a copy of Gilgamesh and the Neverworld found at the archaeological site of Meitaran. Here a passage exists that appears to bridge the end of this poem to the beginning of Gilgamesh and Huawa, with the hero turning from his grief at Enkidu's death to the living one's mountain of the later poem. However, this copy dates from a later period and also contains an inherent contradiction, as Enkidu is consigned to the underworld in the first tale, yet is somehow alive and by Gilgamesh's side again in the second tale. As such, we can conclude that there is no convincing evidence of the unified epic in this period, and its genesis most likely belongs to the centuries ahead. The time has come to move on. 
If we are to find the earliest known appearance of the unified epic of Gilgamesh, we must move forward by a number of centuries into the early second millennium BC. This period coincides with major changes in both Mesopotamian culture and politics. After controlling the region for more than a century, the Ur-3 dynasty came to an abrupt end around the late 21st century BC, with the reasons for this collapse still being unclear. One argument is that this collapse was due to the increasing migration of a group of peoples known as the Amorites into Mesopotamia. These people likely originated to the west, as shown by their Akkadian name Amuru, or Westerners, and seemed to have lived a pastoralist lifestyle that saw them alternate between sedentary living and seasonal nomadism. People with Amorite names have been mentioned in documents from at least the middle of the 3rd millennium BC, but from around the turn of the 2nd millennium BC, we see a vast increase in the number of Amorite names appearing in documents. In the centuries ahead, a number of rulers with Amorite names would also succeed in establishing their own dynasties throughout Mesopotamia, where they quickly assimilated both local customs and belief structures. Whether or not these people played any role in the collapse of the earth free state, however, is a controversial topic amongst archaeologists, and this appearance may simply be a coincidence. What we do know is that early in the reign of the final Ur-Free ruler, Ibi Sin, many of the other cities within the empire ceased paying taxes to Ur, and the whole system by which the state maintained itself quickly collapsed. Unlike the collapse of the Akkadian Empire before it, the end of the Ur-Free dynasty appears to have been relatively orderly, with no sign of disruption throughout southern and central Mesopotamia. The exception to this seems to have been at Ur itself, where later copies of messages have been uncovered addressed from Ibi Sin to an official named Ishbi Era, urging him to buy grain at whatever price it was available in the cities of Isin and Kazalu. It has been argued on the basis of these letters that the region around Ur-3 itself was undergoing a famine during this period. However, their authenticity has been disputed, and it has also been proposed that the need for grain was due to a loss of expected tax revenue from the wider empire. Later Ishbi Era would break away and form his own state at the city of Isin near Nippur, which he also seized control of soon after. Ibi Sin would continue to reign at Ur for another two decades, when an invasion by the Elamites and the king of Shimaski, a state in the region of the Zagros Mountains, seized both him and the city. Ishbi Era would fare better and succeeded in driving out this invasion in his 27th year of rule. He and his successors would later claim hegemony over Sumer and Akkad as heirs to the ur dynasty, but in reality their state was much smaller in scale, with their power being limited to most of southern Mesopotamia. Elsewhere in central and northern Mesopotamia, new rulers would emerge to forge their own states, each of which would attempt to dominate the region in the centuries ahead. The political history of Mesopotamia in the 2nd millennium BC is highly complex, and a full discussion of its events is beyond the scope of this video. Let us suffice, then, with a quick summary. The first four centuries after the collapse of the ur dynasty, running from the beginning of the 20th century BC to the end of the 17th century BC, are collectively known as the Old Babylonian period. In its first two centuries, southern Mesopotamia was dominated by two major players, the dynasty of Isin, founded by Ishbi Era, and a rival state led by the city of Lhasa, along with a number of small states. In central Mesopotamia, a previously unimportant town by the name of Babylon grew into a major city ruled by an Amorite dynasty, whilst to the east the city of Eshnuna became the heart of a powerful state. To the north, the cities of Assur and Ninev became wealthy through their role as trade intermediaries between the developing city-states of Anatolia and those of southern Mesopotamia, whilst to the west lay the Amorite kingdoms of Mari, Yamkad, and Katna. These first two centuries are characterised by a period of almost continual warfare between these states. In the end, however, it was the newcomer of Babylon that would succeed in uniting much of Mesopotamia beneath its rule. Around 1766 BC, a coalition of Elam, Babylon, Mari, and possibly Lhasa sacked Deshnuna ending its bid for hegemony. Two years later, Babylon's king Hammurabi would turn on his former ally and defeat Elam with the help of Eshnuna's new rulers, 
only to turn on this ally again and sack the city once more. Soon afterwards, he would subdue both Mary and Larsa too, incorporating them into a new state that ran from Mary in the northwest to the shores of the Persian Gulf in the south. Soon Hammurabi took on the titles of the Akkadian and Urfri kings before him, dubbing himself King of Sumer and Akkad, King of the Four Quarters. Once again Sumer and Akkad were united, and in the centuries ahead this region would be known under a new name. Babylonia Throughout this period of feuding city-states, the literature and written language of Mesopotamia continued to evolve. Perhaps the most important development from the perspective of the Gilgamesh mythos was a change in the way that the literature was being recorded. Up until the end of the Third Dynasty of Ur, Sumerian had been the dominant written language of both central and southern Mesopotamia. From at least the beginning of the second millennium BC, however, its use would be eclipsed by that of Akkadian which went on to become the diplomatic language of both the Middle East and much of the Eastern Mediterranean. Soon Sumerian was no longer being spoken, and slowly it was limited to the role of an academic language used mostly by scribes. Despite this, works of Sumerian literature continued to be recorded, and this period also saw a major flowering of Akkadian literature throughout the scribal schools of the region. Alongside accounts of the exploits of the kings of Uruk, Lugarbanda and Enmaka, now both firmly established as Gilgamesh's father and grandfather respectively. We see for the first time accounts such as Atana and the Eagle, and of the Akkadian hero Atrahasis. And most importantly for us, it is during this period that we see the first evidence for what is likely a unified epic of Gilgamesh. The old Babylonian epic of Gilgamesh exists today mostly in fragments that have been found at southern centres such as Nippur, Ur and Isin. From what we can tell, many of these tablets appear to have been composed during the training of new scribes who likely copied them down as part of their schooling. Only two tablets are largely complete, the first outlining the taming of Enkidu and his confrontation with Gilgamesh, and the second covering the beginning of the journey to the Cedar Forest. Beyond that, the remaining fragments include portions of Gilgamesh and Enkidu's slaying of the forest guardian Humbaba, along with a section of Gilgamesh's later journey to meet with the survivor of the flood, now for the first time named as Utnapishtim, a simple translation of the name Zisudra into Akkadian. For obvious reasons, the amount of information regarding the development of the epic that can be garnered from this material is limited. It is generally agreed among scholars that the fragments we do have available constitute a unified epic, though due to several factors this is not 100% certain. For a start, the beginning and ending of the two major tablets have not survived in the available copies, meaning that we lack the exact bridging text between the two. It also remains uncertain whether this version of the epic contained all of its later episodes. For example, the old Babylonian episode of the Bull of Heaven has yet to be found and so it cannot be ruled out that this episode was added in later. Some missing plot points are however implied by the presence of the later episodes. For example, we can be reasonably certain that the first tablet would have detailed Gilgamesh's tyranny over the people of Uruk, as otherwise there is no reason for Enkidu to be created in the second tablet. Similarly, Gilgamesh's description of Enkidu's death in the surviving fragment of Tablet 10 indicates that this episode was likely also part of the epic at this time although the exact events that lead to it remain uncertain. Finally, we see the presence of the more unified themes of the exercise of power and kingship, along with Gilgamesh's search for immortality and his love for Enkidu, the loss of whom spurs him on to find a way to thwart death. So how was this new Akkadian epic composed? Well, it's unlikely that we'll ever be sure. It could well be the work of a single author, or the culmination of the work of many different scribes throughout the period. In support of the former theory, it has been argued that the old Babylonian epic is written in a more simple, poetic style than the later standard epic, and scholars such as Andrew R. George have used this to argue that it could well be the work of a single poet of genius. <laughs> 
In support of the latter argument, it must be said that this poetic style does not exclude the possibility that this version of the epic was the result of the cumulative work of more than one author, and that its language is merely the result of a later editor who formalised the text. We also know that scribes will continue to revise the text of the epic in the centuries ahead, and it is possible that a similar process of revision led to the creation of the Old Babylonian version. So putting aside the question of a single author for the moment, what sources may have inspired its composition? The most obvious suggestion is that the Old Babylonian epic would have been composed using the earlier Sumerian poems, with a combination of Akkadian translations and new material being used to establish a unifying plot and themes, as well as to expand on events only mentioned briefly in its forerunners. In the process some less relevant material would naturally have been excised, such as the content of the poem Gilgamesh and Akka. Support for this idea comes from the fact that we know the Sumerian poems were still being copied down by scribes during this period, and it is likely that the author or authors of the unified epic were familiar with them in some fashion. There are some problems with this theory, however. As many Gilgamesh scholars have pointed out, outside of the overall plot points, the text of the epic bears only a slight resemblance to those of the poems with corresponding episodes, and any direct translation of Sumerian into Akkadian can be largely ruled out. One possible explanation for this is that the writers of the Akkadian epic were only loosely familiar with these earlier poems, or as Geoffrey Teague has suggested, that they were working from an Akkadian intermediary that only paraphrased their contents. Andrew R. George has gone further than this, suggesting that the epic of this era may have been based not on the existing poems, but on Akkadian oral traditions within Old Babylonian society. Indeed, from the hymnic refrains seen in later versions of the epic, we can surmise that the epic may well have been sung within Babylonian society, much as the poems before it. After all, if the epic were a familiar form of entertainment during this period, it would in turn make sense for scribes to copy it down as part of their training, or to formally transcribe a record of it. And whilst it is almost impossible to track oral traditions in a dead language, this may also explain the sheer volume of new material seen in this version. The best example of this is the vast expansion in Enkidu's description and backstory. Whilst it has been claimed that there are already some hints of a deeper friendship between Gilgamesh and Enkidu in the Sumerian poems, it is in the Old Babylonian epic that we see Enkidu's role transformed. No longer a simple servant, he has become a wild man, crafted by the gods as Gilgamesh's physical equal. Described as extremely hairy, he begins his life ignorant of the ways of civilization, living and grazing amongst the herd animals of the steppe. After being civilized through intercourse with the prostitute Shamhat, he travels to Uruk, where he comes into conflict with Gilgamesh. After wrestling with him, Enkidu instead becomes the hero's closest companion, and Gilgamesh frequently describes him as the axe by his side. Elsewhere, Gilgamesh is explicitly described as loving him as he would a wife, and it is the loss of Enkidu that directly inspires his quest for immortality. The level of originality of each of these plot points differs, but in particular Enkidu's newfound status as a wild man seems without any clear precursors in Mesopotamian literature. In the past, a number of scholars have argued that these newfound attributes are inspired by earlier Sumerian stereotypes of the Amorites, who they considered an uncivilized people. A commonly cited example of these stereotypes is found in a passage from a composition known as the Marriage of Martu, which dates from the 3rd millennium BC. To quote its text, A tent dweller buffeted by the wind and rain, dwelling in the mountain, the one who digs up mushrooms at the foot of the mountain, who does not know how to bend the knee, who eats uncooked meat, who in his lifetime does not have a house, who on the day of his death will not be buried. Whilst these stereotypes very much reinforce the Sumerian view of the Amorites as uncivilized, it should be noted that they display little overlap with Enkidu's description. For example, the Amorites are mentioned as eating uncooked meat, whilst Enkidu grazes on the grass of the plains, and the Amorites do not share Enkidu's hairiness nor his kinship with wild beasts. It is also clear that by the time the earliest version of the Epic of Gilgamesh appeared, many of the major ruling dynasties of the region could trace their beginnings to Amorite ancestors, and this ancestry would no longer have been considered in a negative light. <laughs> 
There is, however, another document that, according to Geoffrey Teague, may have at least indirectly influenced the epic's depiction of Enkidu. Known as a debate between sheep and grain, it also dates from the 3rd millennium BC and details another version of the Sumerian creation myth. Whilst it is unlikely to have served as a direct textual source for Enkidu's wild man attributes, it does include a description of primordial man with whom he shares some similarities. Quote, Mankind of that time knew not the eating of bread, knew not the wearing of garments. The people went around with skins on their bodies. They ate grass with their mouths like sheep, drank water from ditches. This text then goes on to explain the civilization of mankind by the gods, who mediate to them the mez. This elusive concept is mentioned frequently throughout Sumerian literature, and is roughly thought to mean the norms of civilized society, including sexual intercourse, agriculture, crafts, priesthood, and kingship. This process shows clear parallels to the civilizing of Enkidu, who is first elevated from the beasts by intercourse with a human woman, then taught the ways of humanity by the shepherds of the steppe. So in the old Babylonian period, we see much formalization of the epic's content, and indeed its major additions from this time would remain largely the same in later versions. However, at this stage, much of its content is still missing, and if we wish to see the epic in its familiar form, we must again move forward and examine changes in Mesopotamian politics around the end of the Old Babylonian period. Whilst Hammurabi was able to pass on his unified empire to his son, Samsuiluna, he himself would not be so lucky. After an initial period of stability, Samsuiluna faced two rebellions in the south from the rulers of Lhasa and Uruk, along with an invasion from a new group of peoples from the Zagros Mountains to the east. Known as the Kassites, this group of people would go on to play major roles in Mesopotamian politics, and are perhaps best known for their association with the use of horse-drawn chariots in warfare. Samsu Aluna was successful in thwarting this invasion and in pacifying the south, claiming in one of his year names to have destroyed the wars of both Uruk and Lhasa as punishment. But this success wouldn't last. Soon after the defeat of the southern rebellion, Babylon seems to have largely withdrawn from the area. Alongside this retreat also came a shifting of the center of Mesopotamian religious life. Until now, the central god of the southern and central plains had been Enlil, whose cult was based in the southern city of Nippur. After the Babylonian withdrawal, however, his cult moved northwards to Babylon itself, a move that coincided with the slow elevation of its local god Marduk to the head of the Babylonian pantheon. And most importantly for us, this withdrawal had an unintentional side effect. By forcing many of the scribes of the south to leave their cities, this act unintentionally preserved many of the period's manuscripts within their abandoned households, including the only surviving copies of the Sumerian Gilgamesh poems. Exactly why this retreat occurred is uncertain, and it seems to have been accompanied by major movements of peoples from the south to cities such as Kish and Babylon. Whatever the cause, the result of this withdrawal was that much of the region came under the control of a shadowy group of rulers known as the First Sealand Dynasty for whom we have little inscriptional evidence. To the north and the east, both Assyria and Elam appear to have thrown off Babylonian hegemony around this time, and Samsu Aluna's rule became largely limited to central Mesopotamia. By the end of the 18th century BC, the empire of Hammurabi was already a distant memory. The final century of the Old Babylonian period is poorly documented. We know that Samsu Aluna's successors remained secure in northern Babylonia, and indeed this region seems to have prospered during this time. By the reigns of its final rulers, however, it is clear that Babylon was increasingly in conflict with a number of tribal groupings, who Assyriologist Paul Alain Bulu has associated with the Kassites. Despite this, when the destruction of the first dynasty of Babylon came, it was not at the hands of a Mesopotamian power. Instead, the end came in the form of an attack by the Hittite king Nasili I, 
who sacked Babylon around the beginning of the 16th century. Formed in the late 18th century BC, the Hittites' heartlands lay to the northwest around the city of Hattusa in central Anatolia. By the time of the sack of Babylon, their control had expanded to include much of this region, along with parts of northern Syria previously controlled by Yamkad. Exactly why Mursili chose to attack a region so far from the Hittite heartlands is unclear, and indeed this military venture appears to have been more of a raid to seize plunder rather than any attempt at conquest. Whatever the cause, according to later Babylonian and Hittite documents, Mursili sacked the city around 1595 BC and carried off the cult statue of Marduk. In the resulting power vacuum, the city's Amorite dynasty would be replaced by a Kassite one, although much like their predecessors, these rulers soon took on the trappings of Mesopotamian culture and language. After this, Babylonia descended into something of a dark age for the rest of the 16th century BC, and sources for the early Kassite period are scarce. What we do know is that at some point in the early 15th century BC, the Kassite king Ulam Buryash succeeded in subjugating the Silon dynasty to the south, reuniting Babylonia into a single political unit. By the middle of the 14th century BC, the influence of this unified state was felt as far north as Assyria and as far south as the states of the Persian Gulf, making it one of the great powers of its day. This growth in power coincided with large-scale sponsorship of public building by the Kassite rulers, including a vast new capital city at Dur Kurigalzu, the central ziggurat of which still stands some 57 meters tall today. And most importantly for us, the Kassite period is marked by a new period of creativity in Babylonian literature, along with the development of a literary dialect that would remain standard throughout the region for nearly a millennium. In the middle centuries of the Kassite period, we see some small evidence for a version of the epic that is still in flux. Today this version is known by scholars as the Middle Babylonian Epic of Gilgamesh, although really all we have are a scattering of fragments from Nippur and Ur in the south, from the western cities of Ima, Megiddo and Ugarit, and at the Hittite capital of Hattusa in central Anatolia. Most of these fragments date from around the 14th century BC, and are so disparate that few comparisons can be made either between them or with the text of the old Babylonian version. Perhaps their most important contribution is that they include excerpts from episodes of the epic previously unseen in the old Babylonian version. These include the tale of Gilgamesh's creation and his tyranny over the people of Uruk, the remaining parts of the Cedar Forest expedition, the defeat of the Boar of Heaven, and parts of Enkidu's deathbed speech. We can also see that the text of the epic continued to evolve during this period, and that its copying out appears to remain a staple of scribal instruction throughout Babylonia. Finally, it appears during the only ancient period in which versions of the epic appear to have been written in languages other than Akkadian. This includes a largely unintelligible version of the epic written in Hurrian, the language of a group of people who ruled various states in Syria and northern Mesopotamia, the most notable of which was the state of Mitanni. In the west, this state would prove a powerful foe for both the Hittites and the new kingdom of Egypt throughout the 16th and 15th centuries BC, and would temporarily succeed in subjugating Assyria to the east, for its power collapsed in the 14th century BC. To this we can also add a fragmentary paraphrase of the epic written in Hittite, the exact source of which is difficult to tell. Interestingly, parts of the Bull of Heaven episode are included amongst these fragments, may indicate that such an episode was present in the old Babylonian epic, if this version was derived from it. So moving on from the limited remains of the Middle Babylonian epic, it is during the later centuries of the Kassite period that we finally see the emergence of the Twelve Tablet epic with which most people are familiar today. Known as the Standard or Late Epic, its surviving tablets date from the first millennium BC, and were originally found in the libraries of the Neo-Assyrian kings Ashurbanipal and his grandfather Sennacherib. However, according to scholars such as Andrew George and Mark van der Meeru, it is likely that this work was originally composed during the late second millennium BC, either at the end of the Kassite period or shortly thereafter. The giveaway for this is the highly ornate nature of its text, a style known as Standard Babylonian 
that first appeared in the Kassite period, and that would remain the main literary dialect of the region until the extinction of Akkadian as a major language. Indeed, many of the later copies of these texts were attributed to earlier authors by scribes in the first millennium BC, with themselves broadly grouped into families that claim descent from one of these illustrious ancestors, many of whom bore Kassite names. The epic itself is no exception to this, and by the Neo-Babylonian period it had become recognised as a creation of an especially illustrious ancestor. To quote a list of texts and authors dating from this period. Ceres Gilgamesh, from the mouth of Sinlaiki Unini. Exactly who Sinlaiki Unini was is a contentious question amongst Gilgamesh scholars. Such is the scarcity of information that we have on his life, that any number of arguments have been made both for and against his existence. Even if he did exist, his exact relationship to the text is uncertain. As we've discussed before, serious arguments have been made that the elegant text of the old Babylonian epic was composed by a single author, who may well have been Sinlaiki Unini. Alternatively, if he lived in the Kassite period, then he may simply have been a late editor of the text, who collated the twelve-tablet version that remained standard from that point onwards. He may even have been some influential editor of a Middle Babylonian version of the epic, that provided the blueprints for the standard epic of the late second millennium BC. In the absence of any other evidence about his life, however, there is no real way for us to know which, if any of these possibilities, is true. About the most we can say is that by the first millennium BC, the Babylonians already considered him an ancestor figure of both great antiquity and prestige, as seen by his inclusion in a later version of the Sumerian king list that presents him as the chief scholar during the times of Gilgamesh himself. In reality, this listing has little bearing on fact, and is likely an attempt by these later authors to enhance both their own prestige and that of the text by inflating its antiquity. So what is there to say about the standard epic compared to its predecessors? Well, besides its more ornate literary style, we mostly see a restructuring of existing plot points, rather than wholesale insertions or changes. As we have outlined throughout this video, the newer content found within the epic at this time also reflects ideas and events hinted at in earlier versions of the story, as well as in the Sumerian poems that preceded it. For all we know, this new material may already have been part of the epic by the Old Babylonian period, but regardless of when it was inserted, we must acknowledge that the drafting of these new sections would still have required a great amount of creativity and skill as the writer or writers of the epic would have had to take what were only briefly defined episodes of Gilgamesh's life and expand them into a narrative that combined the overarching themes of the epic. Alongside this, however, we must acknowledge that not all parts of the epic were so successfully integrated. The worst offender in this regard is the final part of the epic, Tablet 12. Widely regarded by scholars as a late appendage to the epic, it consists of a direct Akkadian translation of the second part of the Sumerian poem, Gilgamesh and the Neverworld, beginning immediately after Gilgamesh's toys fall into the underworld. With the exception of some slight expansion of the text, this piece displays little to no integration with the earlier epic, being crudely tacked on without even a bridging sentence in between. The result is that at the beginning of this section, Enkidu is now miraculously alive again before his descent into the underworld and its events proceed largely in a vacuum, disconnected from the previous epic. Exactly when or why this tablet was added into the narrative is uncertain. One theory, voiced by Geoffrey Teague, is that this section was included in order to instruct Gilgamesh on the conditions of the underworld, so as he might better understand the role that he would play after his demise as judge of the dead. Back to the main text of the epic, what is also interesting is how the Mesopotamian society it depicts remains closer to that of the 3rd and the early 2nd millennium BC than that of the Kassite period. For example, in the standard epic, Enlil remains king of the gods, despite him having long been supplanted as the head of the Babylonian pantheon by Marduk. Indeed, by the Kassite period, Enlil had been so demoted that he barely appears in the late Babylonian creation myth, the Enuma Elish, in which Marduk takes on the central role as a lord of creation. As a result, it seems clear that by this point, the larger elements of the epic have become fixed within Babylonian scribal traditions, with the plot points of its ancient storyline being respected, rather than being altered to reflect more contemporary developments.
Putting all these comparatively minor points aside, the standard epic stands out from its prior versions by its inclusion for the first time of what has become the epic's most famous element. We have seen hints of its existence earlier, when discussing the Sumerian poem, the death of Gilgamesh, and the opening of the Sumerian king list. Indeed, it was the inclusion of this element that led to renewed interest in the epic following its initial rediscovery, and that would soon raise its profile to worldwide attention. It is this event that would influence works far beyond its original epic, and shape the canon of both other mythologies and of religions still practiced throughout the world today. The Flood In 1872, a momentous discovery was made by a 32-year-old man in the employ of the British Museum. He held no formal degree, no great scholarship or position, being a mere assistant to the more renowned Assyriologist Sir Henry Rawlinson. His name was George Smith. He came from a humble background, being born to working-class parents in a cramped London tenement. To put it bluntly, People with his background were not wanted in the academic world of the 19th century, and his parents had been under no illusions as to his chances. His formal education ended when he was only 14, and instead of attending high school, he was soon apprenticed as a banknote engraver. During this apprenticeship, however, the young smith became obsessed with biblical studies, along with the emerging field of Assyriology. Named for its initial focus on excavations at Assyrian cities such as Nineveh in northern Mesopotamia, at the time this field was still largely unformalized. Indeed, many of its earliest excavations have been conducted by amateurs interested in determining the truth of the biblical account of history. Cuneiform itself had only been painstakingly deciphered over the course of the last three decades, and Henry Rawlinson's first volume on the Cuneiform inscriptions of Western Asia had only recently been published when Smith arrived at the museum in 1861. As David Damrosch notes in his work, The Buried Book, the disorganized nature of the field offered Smith a rare gap in the armor of the British establishment, where his lack of formal schooling would be considered less of a barrier to entry. Somehow or another, the young man managed to insert himself into the disorganized department, hurrying to the museum during his lunch break on the three days that the museum was open to the public. At first he drew no attention, going ignored by the department's two members of permanent staff. Eventually, however, they realized to their surprise that this young man could read cuneiform better than any of themselves, and soon Rawlinson would convince the museum to hire him on as an assistant curator. By all accounts, the pay was unimpressive, but it did not dampen Smith's enthusiasm for the job, and soon he was working long hours piecing together cuneiform tablets for transcription. In 1866, he published his first article, and the next year Rawlinson had the museum hire him on as his assistant for the future volumes of cuneiform inscriptions. As Smith himself would describe it, this hiring marked his official entry into public life. But despite this progress, his great ambition of excavating in Mesopotamia himself went unrealized, and he was unable to convince the university trustees to finance such an expedition. Indeed, by this point, many of them felt that the museum already had enough of what they dubbed primitive Babylonian and Assyrian artifacts. Then in November of 1872, whilst working on Volume 4 of Rawlinson's series, Smith was sorting through a group of tablets that had laid untranscribed in the museum archives for the last quarter century. They had been discovered at Nineveh in the 1840s by the pioneering archaeologists Olmud Rassam and Austin Henry Layard, comprising of a trove of some 22,000 tablets known as the Library of the Neo-Assyrian King Ashurbanipal. As Smith later recollected, I noticed references to the creation in a tablet numbered K63 in the museum collection, and allusions in other tablets to similar legends. I therefore set about searching through the collection. Commencing a steady search among these fragments, I soon found half of a curious tablet which had evidently contained originally six columns of text. 
Two of these were still nearly perfect, two others were imperfect, about half remaining, while the other remaining columns are entirely lost. On looking down the third column, my eye caught the statement that the ship rested on the mountains of Nazir, followed by the account of the sending forth of the dove and its finding no resting place and returning. I saw at once that I had here discovered a portion, at least, of the Chaldean account of the deluge. According to later accounts by his contemporaries, so excited by this discovery was Smith that he leapt up and began to strip off his clothing, although he made no mention of such an event in his own account. Whether it happened or not, word of his discovery spread quickly. As we mentioned before, the society of his time was one that was growing increasingly sceptical about the literal truth of the Bible. It had only been 13 years since the publication of Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species, and by the time of Smith's discovery, the theory of evolution had been largely accepted by the wider scientific community. Advances in the understanding of geology were also similarly undercutting many of the foundational stories of the biblical creation, and textual critics had begun to cast doubt on the Bible's presentation of history. As such, Smith's presentation of his findings to a meeting of the Biblical Archaeology Society on the 3rd of December, which included amongst its audience the then Prime Minister William Gladstone, led to immediate attention from the worldwide press. Soon after, newspapers on either side of the Atlantic were trumpeting Smith's discovery, and what they saw as its clear connections with the biblical story of Noah. To quote the New York Times, Noah's log of the deluge is said to have turned up among some ancient Chaldean inscriptions, and an account of it, which has been given by Mr. George Smith of the British Museum, has caused a good deal of excitement especially one passage in which the gods of the period are described as feeling very bad and sitting like dogs with their tails between their legs. This irreverent remark occurs in a narrative of the deluge, which purports to have been given by one of the survivors to a Chaldean monarch named Isdubar. The original composition of the narrative is placed at the latest in the 17th century before the Christian era, and it might be much earlier. At the same time, however, the paper sounded a cautionary note. For the present, the Orthodox people are in great delight, and are very much prepossessed by the corroboration which Sisit affords to biblical history. It is possible, however, as has been pointed out, that the Chaldean inscription, if genuine, may be regarded as a confirmation of the statement that there are various traditions of the deluge apart from the biblical one, which are perhaps legendary like the rest. The discovery of the flood portion of the Gilgamesh epic launched Smith to immediate preeminence as an Assyriologist, and gave him the opportunity to realise his dream of excavating in the field. Over the next four years, Smith would conduct three expeditions to Nineveh, publishing his findings in volumes that were as much travelogues as they were reports. In 1876, he published his translation of the Gilgamesh epic under the title The Chaldean Account of Genesis, placing its flood myth full and centre. By the time of his unexpected death, he had eclipsed his contemporaries in fame, and appeared to be on the precipice of a long and distinguished career. Unfortunately for him, his young family, and the field of Assyriology, his third expedition to Nineveh, would be his last. On the return journey, he stopped in a small village outside of Aleppo, where he came down with dysentery. His companions managed to rush him to the city in search of medical aid, but nothing could be done and he died there on August 19th, 1876. He was just 36 years old. The flood myth contained in the Gilgamesh epic received worldwide attention from the moment of its discovery, and remains one of the primary sources of interest in the story to this day. Whilst much of the focus placed upon it is due to its connections with the later biblical flood story, it should be emphasised that to the Mesopotamians themselves, the Flood was a seminal event in history. Before it came an age when gods and primordial forces stalked the land, when humanity, animals and the first cities were created, and when the kingship itself first descended from the heavens. In these antediluvian times, they believed that kings reigned for thousands of years, and the population of the world far outweighed that of later Mesopotamian society. In Tablet 11 of the Epic of Gilgamesh, we have only a paraphrase of the Flood's events, but even this lays bare the scale of its destruction. 
In this tablet, the survivor of the flood, Utsnapishtim, relates the story of its events to Gilgamesh in order to explain his immortality. We learn that in a previous age, the city of Shuropak, located on the Euphrates to the south of Nippur, was home to the gods Anu, Enlil, Ninurta, Enugi, and Ea, the Babylonian name for the Sumerian god Enki. So great had mankind multiplied in those days that it was said the whole world bellowed like a bull, and this noise roused the anger of the king of the gods, Enlil. He decreed that humanity should be exterminated, and that all life should perish beneath the waters of a giant flood. In doing so, he also made the other gods swear an oath of secrecy, but after the decision was made, Ea crept out of the council. By pretending to speak to the wall of a reed hut, he warned the mortal man Utnapishtim of the coming flood. Following Ea's advice, Utnapishtim tore down his house and built a boat with seven decks that measured 120 cubits on all sides. After seven days' labour, the boat was complete, and Utnapishtim loaded onto it all of his gold and family, along with his craftsmen and beasts both wild and tame. That evening, as predicted, the storm god Adad flooded the land with a torrential downpour, lasting for six days and nights. Terrified by the storm that they have unleashed, the gods cowered like dogs, whilst Ishtar bemoans the drowning of mankind. Utnapishtim's boat survives, however, and on the seventh day of the flood, he throws open a porthole, only to reveal water stretching as far as the eye can see. Finally, land appears in the form of the peak of Mount Nasir on which Utnapishtim's boat runs aground. After seven more days, he sends out first a dove and a swallow, both of whom return after finding no place to land. Finally, he sends out a raven, who finds that the waters have receded and does not return. Utnapishtim then performs a great sacrifice on the mountain, the fragrance of which draws the gods one by one. Ishtar soon arrives, and she bemoans Enlil's folly in calling for humanity's destruction. Eventually Enlil himself arrives, angry at humanity's survival, only to be shamed by both Ishtar and Enki. Finally Enlil then blesses both Utnapishtim and his wife with immortality, and sets them at the mouth of the rivers to dwell for all time. Since its initial discovery, comparisons have rightly been drawn between this story and the account of the flood given in the book of Genesis, where the role of Utnapishtim is taken by the patriarch Noah and his family. Indeed, when placed side by side, the two stories are almost identical, with only minor changes being inserted into the Genesis narrative to fit with the wider biblical canon. For example, in the Genesis flood story, the many gods of the Mesopotamian pantheon are replaced by the single god of the Bible, who now has to perform both the role of summoning the flood to destroy humanity and of warning the last righteous man and his family to build the ark. Conversely, the Genesis story retains even small details of the Gilgamesh flood myth, down to the god of the Bible being pleased by the scent of Noah's sacrifice, much as were his Mesopotamian predecessors. As such, it is now widely agreed by scholars that the events of the Genesis Flood narrative are taken almost wholesale from Gilgamesh, and that other Mesopotamian myths such as the Enuma Elish also appear to have influenced the wider biblical account of creation. And going beyond the biblical account, other mythologies also show flood stories with clear influences from Gilgamesh. In Greek mythology, a similar flood myth concerns the adventures of the Greek hero Deucalion, in this account, Zeus has grown angry at the actions of the bronze race of men, and decides to eliminate them by flooding most of Greece with an abundance of rain. On the advice of his father, Prometheus, Deucalion survives this downpour by building a great chest, into which he places himself and his wife, Pyrrha, along with enough provisions to last out the flood. After nine days and nights, Deucalion comes to rest on the shores of Mount Parnassus, where Zeus rewards him with whatever his heart desires. Deucalion then uses this wish to repopulate Greece, turning the stones he and his wife threw into men and women. So the Gilgamesh flood myth was clearly a major influence on the later mythologies of the Eastern Mediterranean. But where exactly did it originate? Going only by the material we have discussed so far in this video, it may seem like this story is an entirely new addition to the standard epic. 
Whilst we know that the survivor of the Flood was associated in some way with Gilgamesh as far back as one of the Sumerian poems, we have no evidence at all of the Flood story in any earlier version of the epic. In itself, this may simply be an accident of survival, as only portions of the old and middle Babylonian epic remain. But if we instead look to the wider literature of Mesopotamia, it becomes clear that there are at least two older Flood myths that appear in both Akkadian and Sumerian texts. The first and better attested of these two is the Akkadian creation myth, the Atrahasis, the oldest versions of which date to the Old Babylonian period. Whilst the story itself claims to be concerned with the flooding of the world by the gods, it actually begins by outlining the human creation myth. According to its texts, after the Anunnaki gods have divided the world between them, they force the younger gods, known as Ijiji, to labour on their behalf. After labouring for 3,600 years, the Ajiji gods grow tired and rebel against the Anunnaki. To solve this problem, the Anunnaki then slaughter the god Iloela, then have Ea and the crater goddess Mami craft humanity by mixing his blood with clay. After 600 years pass, humanity multiplies so much that their noise angers the great god Enlil, and from here an almost exact equivalent of the Gilgamesh flood epic plays out. Although in this story the hero's name is Atrahasis, who, much like Utnapishtim, also dwells within the city of Shuropak. The second Mesopotamian flood story is somewhat briefer, and is attested today only in the form of a single fragmentary tablet written in Sumerian. Known by the titles of the Eridu Genesis, or simply the Deluge, this story dates from around 1600 BC, and outlines yet another variant of the Mesopotamian creation myth. In this story we again see the creation of mankind by the Anunnaki, which in this tale comprises of the gods An, Enlil, Enki, and Ninasag. After a missing portion of the text, we hear that An and Enlil have decided to destroy humanity, and they force each god to swear not to interfere. To get around this, Enki tells the plan of the gods to a wall, behind which is hidden the hero of the tale, Ziosudra. After another missing passage, which presumably detailed the construction of a vessel by Ziasudra, we hear that after the flood has raged for seven days and nights, the waters fall quiet. The Sumerian sun god Utu then appears, and Ziasudra dutifully makes a sacrifice in his honour. After a final missing section, we find the hero prostrating himself before Anu and Enlil, who grant him eternal life and place him to the south of Mesopotamia in the land of Dilmun. Upon its translation in 1912, it was initially presumed that the Sumerian story of the Deluge was the predecessor to the Flood story of Gilgamesh, much as the Sumerian Gilgamesh poems may have preceded the Old Babylonian epic. Over time, however, it has become clear that the account of the Flood given in Gilgamesh is more likely to be a paraphrased version of the Atrahasis, and according to Stephanie Daly, the Sumerian story itself may well be derived from the Akkadian account. As proof of this, Geoffrey T. Gay has offered several pieces of evidence. Firstly, not only are the plot points of the two almost identical, but some lines in the epic are copied almost word for word from the Atrahasis. For example, in Tablet 11 of the epic, the list of gods present at the meeting to decide humanity's fate is copied over exactly from the opening of the Atrahasis, even though in the Gilgamesh version some of these gods play no role whatsoever in its events, and figures that do, such as Ishtar, are absent. Secondly, the flood of the Atrahasis is already present in its old Babylonian version, where it plays a key role in the story. By comparison, the Gilgamesh flood story appears only later in the standard epic, and there plays no clear part in its central quest. Finally, there also exists something of a smoking gun. In line 187 of the tablet, where the author accidentally names up Snapishtim as Atrahasis. So it seems likely that whilst the version of the Flood myth presented in Tablet 11 was first introduced into the Epic of Gilgamesh in the late 2nd millennium BC, developed versions of the myth date back at least as far as the Old Babylonian period. Before that all we have are scattered references in documents dating from the end of the 3rd millennium BC, leaving us uncertain as to what significance its legend would have held during these earlier periods. We are aware of at least three earlier Sumerian creation myths that may well date to the early dynastic period, known as the Barton Cylinder, the debate between winter and summer, and the previously mentioned debate between sheep and grain. However, none of these creation myths mention the flood. 
possibly indicating that it had not yet taken on its significance within the beliefs of the region. So now that we have gone back as far as the available literary works allow us, let us conclude our examination of the Mesopotamian flood myth by asking a question that occupied many early archaeologists during the excavations of Mesopotamian centres in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Is there any evidence that the Mesopotamian flood myth was inspired by a real-life flood event that took place either in Mesopotamia itself or throughout the wider Middle East? Indeed, this question would feature prominently in many of the early reports of finds from this region during the 1920s and 30s. Indeed, this question would feature prominently in many of the early reports of finds from this region during the 1920s and 30s. What also complicates matters is that since the late 90s, a new hypothesis has emerged that attempts to explain the origin of this myth from outside of Mesopotamia, a claim which has in turn been fed by copious press attention. So before we move on to examine any potential evidence for a flood within Mesopotamia itself, let us briefly discuss this hypothesis. In 1997, what has become known as the Black Sea Deluge Hypothesis was first suggested by geologists William Ryan and Walter Pitt. According to this hypothesis, which has since been somewhat revised, around the end of the 6th millennium BC, there was a catastrophic inundation of salt water from the Mediterranean into what is now the Black Sea. These authors have argued that this sudden rise in sea level would have had a catastrophic effect on the Neolithic communities in the surrounding region and it is the memory of this catastrophe that would have inspired the later Mesopotamian flood myth. Later an alternative to this hypothesis was also suggested by A. L. Chapaliga, that this inundation actually took place somewhere between the 15th and the 11th millennium BC, with the source of flooding instead being the Caspian Sea to the east. Now bear in mind that I'm far from a geologist, and as such I'm unqualified to judge whether either of these events actually occurred. But looking at it from the outside, these hypotheses seem to be heavily contested, with many geologists debating the extent and timing of each of these hypothetical inundations. Moreover, the available archaeological evidence shows no great sign of population movement throughout the period of these inundations that can be directly tied to such a catastrophic flooding. We do know that from the second half of the 7th millennium BC, there is evidence of sizable movements of people out of Turkey, both to the west into Greece and further on into Europe, and to the east going as far as Egypt. However, it is still uncertain whether these movements could have been caused by such a major inundation event, and indeed there are other environmental reasons, such as an ongoing climate event known as the 8.2 Killier event, that may explain these movements. But even if we assume that all of these events did in fact happen, the idea of them having inspired the Mesopotamian flood myth relies on an unprecedented period of oral storytelling even the youngest date for a Black Sea inundation being separated from the first mentions of the Flood by nearly three millennia. It also fails to explain why no evidence of such an event was preserved in other cultures closer to the centre of the event, such as the Old Hittite Kingdom, which was a contemporary of the Old Babylonian Atrahasis. Finally, there is also no reason to think that the ancient Mesopotamians would have had to rely on such a distant event to inspire their own Flood narratives as seasonal flooding would have been more the norm than the exception on the alluvial plain. As we discussed in the early parts of this video, agriculture in southern Mesopotamia during the 3rd and 2nd millennia BC would have relied on careful systems of water management to be successful, and too much river water could easily have damaged cropland. A particularly devastating flood could even wash away immature plants in the middle of the growing season, resulting in a poor harvest and starvation. Major floods could even swamp and destroy the mud-brick homes of those who live nearby. In cities such as Uruk, this would have posed a particular danger, as evidence indicates that the ancient course of the Euphrates River flowed through the centre of the city itself. The result of all of this is that there is far more reason to think that the ancient Mesopotamians would be more inspired by their own living conditions, rather than a hypothetical event that took place millennia before. So putting aside the idea of a Black Sea hypothesis, is there any evidence for a more localised flood in Mesopotamia itself, the catastrophic effects of which may have provided the core for the later myths? The answer is complex. Evidence for major flood strata has indeed been unearthed at a number of ancient cities throughout southern Mesopotamia, 
The most substantial of these had been found at three sites, at Kish to the north, at the site of the later flood mess Shuropak, and near what would have then been the southern coastline at the city of Ur. Luckily for us, an account of the discovery of the flood layer at the last of these was penned by the site's principal excavator, Sir Leonard Woolley. It took place during the course of the 1928 to 1929 digging season. After excavating his most famous find, the Royal Cemetery of Ur, Woolley ordered a small test shaft dug into the soil beneath. After progressing through the occupation layers, he soon reached eight feet of empty mud. However, under this, he discovered to his surprise yet more occupation debris, dating from the 4th millennium BC. Of this puzzling interruption in sequence, he quickly formed an interpretation, though he hesitated to share it. In the end, it was his wife, fellow archaeologist Catherine Woolley, who gave voice to his suspicions. To quote his later writings, By the time I had written up my notes, was quite convinced of what it all meant, but I wanted to see whether others would come to the same conclusion, so I brought up two of my staff, and, after pointing out the facts, asked for their explanation. They did not know what to say. My wife came along and looked and was asked the same question, and she turned away, remarking casually, Well, of course, it's the flood. In the season prior to Woolley's discovery of the flood strata at Ur, two archaeologists named Stephen Langdon and Louis Watelin were directing a series of excavations at the city of Kish, which had begun in the early 1920s. During the course of their investigations, they came across what they described as a thick layer of sand deposited by a flood, beneath which they found a series of brick tombs. Despite discovering this layer earlier than Woolley, they were slower to publish their findings, and in one of those twists that academics around the world will be familiar with, Woolley received both the credit and the lion's share of publicity. Later excavations conducted at the city of Shuropak similarly uncovered a flood stratum, a finding that was given particular significance given its status as the home of the survivors of each of the Mesopotamian flood myths. So are these scattered flood strata evidence of a large-scale flood throughout Mesopotamia, the distant memory of which led to the flood story of the Atrahasis, of Gilgamesh, and of the story of Deucalion and the biblical flood in turn? The answer is almost certainly no. Whilst these findings were received with great enthusiasm at the time, the idea that they represented a single, region-wide flood quickly ran into difficulties. For a start, no evidence of flood strata on this scale had been found during excavations at any of the other southern Mesopotamian sites dating from this period. This comes despite the fact that many of these centres were located close to sites with flood strata and were indeed fed by the same river system. And when it comes to the three centres with evidence of flooding, even a cursory examination of the evidence throws up further problems. As laid out by David MacDonald in a 1988 article on the subject, it is immediately obvious that the timing of these layers do not always overlap, and each one varied in their intensity. At Ur, we see evidence for a single large flood event dating from around the middle of the 4th millennium BC. By comparison at Kish, we see evidence of three separate floods, two of them dating to the beginning of the early dynastic period, and a third dating from around 2600 BC. What also complicates this picture is that these assigned dates precede more modern developments in radiocarbon dating, casting some doubt on their accuracy. And even if we are to accept the idea that these floods did in some way influence the later accounts of the flood found in Sumerian and Akkadian literature, we would still have to explain the many centuries between them and the first known description of the deluge. As with the old Babylonian version of the Epic of Gilgamesh, we could argue that such accounts may have been passed down in oral tradition during this time, but ultimately there is no way of proving this theory. As such, we must conclude that there is no strong evidence that these floods had anything to do with the later Mesopotamian story, and at the most all we can say is that these legends may well have been inspired by the frequent flooding that came as part of life on the alluvial plain. So what became of the Epic of Gilgamesh after the appearance of the Standard Version? Well, as we previously discussed, this work seems to have remained popular as a tool of scribal instruction well into the first millennium BC, 
in addition to its appearance as part of the libraries of the Neo-Assyrian kings, we know of more than 70 copies that have been unearthed throughout the Middle East. By the first millennium BC, it already appears to have been considered a work possessing great antiquity and wisdom, which may explain how much of its text remained fossilised compared to other epics of the period. Exactly how popular it was within wider society, however, we cannot say. As noted by Andrew R. George, its popularity as a teaching tool may indicate that the stories of Gilgamesh were still familiar to the average person, as transcribing a well-known story would have been an ideal starting point for teaching the cuneiform writing system. Unfortunately, we have no clear way of knowing if this is true. It is entirely possible that by this time, knowledge of Gilgamesh had become limited only to courtly scribes, along with rulers interested in his ideal of kingship. What we can say is that despite its continued importance throughout the early and mid-first millennium BC, the slow waning of the Akkadian language from the 6th century BC onwards in favour of Aramaic also seems to have resulted in a decline in the epic's copying. Even then, parts of its story would continue to influence other works throughout the Middle East and the Eastern Mediterranean. In the archaic Greece of the early 1st millennium BC, the Gilgamesh story likely had a significant influence on the development of both the Iliad and the Odyssey. In the latter work, the exploits of Odysseus parallel many of those accomplished by Gilgamesh, such as his contention with the giant Polyphemus, his visit to the Neverworld, and his refusal of immortality through his spurning of the nymph Calypso. On top of these, Gilgamesh is also thought to have influenced the characteristics of the most famous Greek hero, Heracles. Much like Gilgamesh, this figure displays supernatural strength and stature, is mortal and yet of divine parentage, and garbs himself in the skin of a lion. These attributes may similarly have influenced the description of the biblical judge, Samson, who was possessed of immense strength until his long hair was cut. And in addition to the incorporation of the Mesopotamian flood myth into both the Jewish Torah and the Christian Old Testament, Gilgamesh and Humbaba are also thought to appear in the apocryphal Book of Giants, where their names are assigned to a pair of giants unrelated to the events of the epic. Gilgamesh also seems to have survived as a popular figure into the Roman period. In the 2nd century, the author Alien includes an account of Gilgamesh's miraculous birth and usurpation of the throne of Uruk from his grandfather, a story that has clear parallels to those surrounding the birth of the Akkadian Emperor, Sargon the Great. Finally, scholar Stephanie Daly has suggested that the later story of Bulukwia in the Arabian Nights bears some similarity to Gilgamesh's quest to meet the immortal survivor of the Flood, though this interpretation has been disputed. Despite its clear influences on these later works, by the end of the first millennium BC, the epic itself appears to have lost much of its importance. According to Geoffrey Teagay, its last known copy dates from either the 2nd or the 1st century BC and the last cuneiform documents to contain any mention of Gilgamesh date from around the 2nd century. As with most Babylonian literature, the decline and eventual extinction of cuneiform writing saw the end of the epic's relevance, and from this point onwards it was lost for more than 2,000 years. Its most well-known copies were lost even earlier, remaining sealed in the burnt library of Ashurbanipal after the fall of Nineveh to a combined force of Medes, Babylonians and Scythians in the year 612 BC. Ironically, it is this baking process that may well have served to preserve the tablets, and allowed their fragments to survive until their rediscovery by Holmud's Rassam in the early 1850s. Even then, however, Gilgamesh himself remained an obscure figure, and the publicity surrounding George Smith's initial translation of the epic was almost entirely focused on the flood narrative contained within Tablet 11. What didn't help matters was that the highly fragmentary state of the available materials at the time meant that the initial translations of the Epic of Gilgamesh, or Isdubar as he was mistakenly known, bore little resemblance to the epic that we know today. Over time, however, more and more fragments of the epic were unearthed, resulting in a series of increasingly accurate translations in the early 20th century by scholars such as Peter Jensen, Alexander Heidel, Ephraim Spazer, and Noah Kramer. After the end of World War II, awareness of the Gilgamesh epic also began to grow beyond the realms of academia. In the UK, 
Douglas Jeffrey Bridson's 1953 radio play, The Quest of Gilgamesh, helped to popularise an adapted version of the epic to the general public. Whilst in post-war Germany, the ruined cities, huge death toll, and population movements of the post-war period drew comparisons to the epic by a series of celebrated poets and novelists. Around this time, authors also began to take note of the homoerotic elements in Gilgamesh and Enkidu's relationship, and a long literary trend began of depicting the two as lovers. From the 1960s, Gilgamesh would continue to reach a yet larger audience, and in the 60 years since, he has appeared in almost every artistic medium possible. Obviously, a full discussion of all of Gilgamesh's appearances in popular culture is more than this video can hope to achieve. But perhaps the best summary of Gilgamesh's modern role is given by Fyodor Ziolkowski in his work Gilgamesh Among Us. Here he wrote that Gilgamesh has achieved something few other mythic figures have accomplished. By establishing himself simply as a name or character, often independent from the epic itself. The result is that there are few people in Western culture to whom he is entirely unfamiliar, even if the epic itself is unknown to them. So as we end here today, we can say with confidence that whether or not an actual Gilgamesh ever existed, his name and exploits have managed to live on in popular culture, long after those of Mesopotamia's greatest monarchs have been all but forgotten. And looking back now, millennia after the society that composed his epic has vanished from the face of the earth, it seems that his quest to overcome death may not have been so futile after all. Hello everybody, it's Charles here. Thank you for watching the video all the way through. This one's certainly been quite a long time coming, so I hope you enjoyed it. Before we end here today, I just want to say a quick thank you to the archaeologist Dr. Jeff Emberling for allowing me to use some of his photos of various Sumerian cities in this video. You can find a link to his research profile in the description below. If you also want to keep up to date on what's happening on this channel, you can always follow me on Twitter over at twitter.com slash the underscore histocrat. And if you'd like to support the channel a little further, you can also head over to patreon.com slash the histocrat. Thank you and take care folks.